I was 15 or 16 years old when the 16th Gyalwa Karmapa visited our monastery. At that time, he was still a small child and Siju Rinpoche was with him. Karmapa stayed for three days and gave a crown ceremony with a small black hat. He had not brought the large one with him. He also gave us a Chenrezig empowerment. <laughs> Following his visit, I started a three-year retreat, and after that, I went on a one-year pilgrimage throughout Tibet, which led me to Tsurpu. There again, I met the Karmapa and took part in a crown ceremony. <laughs> From central Tibet, I traveled directly back home to East Tibet and spent seven or eight years in solitude. Then the Karmapa visited Nang Chen. A large tent was set up and many traveled there to see the Karmapa. Our whole community was there, with the exception of the cooks. Two of my retreat friends traveled with me and after our meeting with the Karmapa, we spent some years in the mountains meditating in complete solitude. Thereafter, we went to Urchin Rinpoche's retreat place in Kongpo and practiced there for six months. Our next pilgrimage lasted three years. We traveled through Tibet all the way to Mount Kailash. Then we felt it was time to return home. On the trip back, we visited Surpu again. We heard that the Karmapa was already on his way out of Tibet and was staying at Palsan Joari. We immediately set out to join him there, but on the way we were stopped by the Chinese. <laughs> We met friends and relatives in a town called Nye. There we practiced the ritual of Dorje Trolu to overcome disturbing influences. Finally, we found out that the 16th Karmapa had reached exile and safety. We then retreated in a cave high up in the mountains in a valley called Lo, where Rechungpa once practiced and meditated. During a Tsog ritual, we decided to flee Tibet, but it seemed almost impossible because the Chinese had already cut off all escape routes. We kept meeting up with Tibetans who reported their unsuccessful attempts to flee and that there were no other routes open. I requested help and protection from the Three Jewels, asked them to lead me, for I was determined to escape. Other Tibetans tried to dissuade me, for they were convinced that the Chinese would kill me along with the others. But I was sure that fleeing was the best thing to do and that the Three Jewels would protect us. Our escape route was in a real path. On the one side were very steep cliffs and on the other the Brahmaputra. In this way, the Chinese had the entire route under their control. We waited until darkness in order not to be seen. The Chinese had flashlights. We were so near to them that we could see their cigarettes and cups. Although our whole bodies were shaking from fear, we simply prayed to the three jewels and went on. It took two hours to get through the Chinese, and it was due to the blessing of the refuge that they didn't catch us. The Tibetans that accompanied me were overwhelmed and very thankful because of this miracle. On our way to India, we didn't see anybody for three weeks. It was only near the border of India that we met a few resistance fighters. One of them was sick, folded up from terrible pain, and requested help from us lamas. I prayed for him, 
gave him blessings, and shortly thereafter he recovered. <laughs> the resistance fighters relayed a message to the next post that a great Lama was on the way and that they should do everything to help him. Thereby, all difficulties were overcome. Once in India, we stayed in the Musimare refugee camp for three days. The Indian government then informed us that we would go with 300 kampas to work in Sikkim. They had a difficult time as laborers building the roads there and requested that I do tar prayers for them. I spent the next three weeks with the kampas in Sikkim. During this time, I discovered that the karmapa was presently in Rumtek, so I went there with a friend. When we arrived at the monastery, it was evening and the monks were assembled in the temple performing a puja. The Karmapa was also there and he signaled to me to come to him. Soup had just been distributed to the monks and the Karmapa instructed them to give me some soup as well. The monk responsible for giving out the soup told me that I had to drink it outside, but the Karmapa invited me to stay, and since I didn't own a bowl, he saw to it that I was given one. After the puja, the Karmapa went up to his room. We wanted to talk to him, so we followed him upstairs. But one of the monks stopped us and said that we should come the next morning, because the Karmapa never gave audiences in the evening. As we went down the stairs, one of the Karmapa's monks ran after us and said that the Karmapa wanted to see the two visiting senior lamas, and that we should come immediately. We were finally with the Karmapa, and he blessed us with both hands. One of his servants wanted to send us away again, but the Karmapa invited us to stay. He told us that we should live in Rumtek, and said that if we could take care of ourselves, we should do that. If not, we could come at any time, inform his monks, and they would take care of us. In the case the monks couldn't give us what we needed, the Karmapa would direct his kitchen to provide us with whatever we require. We really couldn't believe what was happening. Of course, my friend and I were happy to be with the Karmapa and to have received his blessing. But we didn't know exactly what to do. We didn't actually want to live in the monastery. It is said that if one spends too much time very close to one's Lama, there is a danger in breaking one's Samayas. That never had happened to us and we didn't want it to develop in that way. At the same time, we had no desire to bother the Kamapa with our thoughts. Shortly thereafter, the Kamapa requested us to see him and told us that we should accompany the Kempo to Baksa, who would leave the next morning. In Kalimpong, we should stay in the house of a generous patron of the Karmapa. However, there was a small problem. The Kempo held an Indian passport with which he could travel to Baksa at any time. But we only had Sikkimese identification and needed special permission to make the trip. The Karmapa immediately contacted the Sikkimese authorities and requested them to issue the necessary documents. He definitely wanted to send us with a Kempo. Everything worked out perfectly and we started our journey to Kalimpong the next day. 
I don't recall exactly how long I lived with the Karmapa's patron in Kalimpong, who had a large temple next to his house. He took care of me, and in that way I could do Dharma practice the entire time without having to undertake other work. I didn't have to go anywhere, even, for example, to hold rituals. My patron then traveled for many months, so I left Kalimpong too. I went to Darjeeling, met some friends there, and spent one month in Sonoda with Norla. The Karmapa then called me in Sonoda and told me that I should now go to Bhutan. I told him that I would not do this because I had already decided to do a three-year retreat with Norla. The Karmapa replied, no, definitely not. And he sent Tsongpun Kunchok with a jeep to immediately pick me up and drive me to Bhutan. The queen had just constructed a temple there, which she had requested the Karmapa to take care of. Actually, I really wanted to practice in retreat, and sure enough, the situation arose that I could practice in solitude next to the king's palace. Someone else took over the responsibility of rituals in the temple. The king of Bhutan then died and the Karmapa and Dujum Rinpoche were invited to hold the ritual ceremonies. These dealt with a certain form of chud practice and both requested that I perform them. On the way to Timphu, I stayed for a while in Pagdru Taksang, where we practiced the Guru Rinpoche Tsog ritual, Sampa Lundra, 100,000 times. It was the queen's mother who requested these rituals. <laughs> At that time, Dingo Kense Rinpoche was residing in Pagdru Kichu. One day he asked me to come to him and I stayed for one week. Topka Rinpoche had just built a house and was searching for a lama who would perform different rituals. He invited me to do these. <laughs> Dingo Kensei Rinpoche told me that I should go to Europe and that he could help me to get a passport, though I told him I would never go to Europe. Kensei Rinpoche asked me whether I was sure of this, and I said, definitely sure, and that this is my final decision. He replied, you don't want to go to Europe, but you will be going anyway. <laughs> At this time, the Karmapa returned to Bhutan and invited me for breakfast the next day. As I sat with him, he told me that he would be traveling to the West during this year and would visit many countries. The Karmapa wanted to find out whether there would be an openness for the Buddha's teachings in the West. The Karmapa said to me, if the general development in the West is positive, then you have to go there. You shouldn't protest, always insisting that you would prefer to stay here. I already told the Bhutanese Minister for Internal Affairs that you would need a passport, and he started to take the necessary steps. If I have the impression that the Dharma would flourish in the West, I will then know if America or France would be the best for you. You should then establish a Dharma center and a monastery there. The general decision is made, and you shouldn't resist. I simply sat there and said absolutely nothing. I thought to myself, what should I say? I don't know anything. Back at Topka Rinpoche's, I told him that the Karmapa advised me on many things. 
Topgala asked what had happened, and I told him that Karmapa said I should go to an area called Europe. Topgala Rinpoche replied, This is not out of the ordinary. You should go to the West. I replied, If that's what it is, then I say no. I will apologize to the Karmapa and tell him that I cannot go. I requested Topgala to lend me his car because I immediately wanted to clarify this with the Karmapa. However, he said, you won't be able to change it. I have already spoken with the Karmapa about this, and even the Minister for Internal Affairs tried to change the Karmapa's mind. Nevertheless, the Karmapa insists that you travel to the West, and if you go to see him now and request him not to send you, he will only be unhappy about it. So, that is why I did not go to the Karmapa again, and shortly thereafter, he traveled to the West. After the Karmapa returned, he sent his personal attendant, Simpon, to take me to Rumtek. We left right away, and I directly went to the Karmapa. He told me about his travels and said, I was just now all over America and Europe. I am sure that Buddhism will flourish. As far as the practice is concerned, it seems that there will be more activity in Europe. In France, I have already been given a piece of land. That's where you should go. I replied, what should I do there? I'm not capable of anything. Why should I be the one to go there? The Karmapa simply replied, don't think like that. When you first came to Rumtek, I told you to stay and guide the three-year retreat. Then the Kempa went to Baksa, and I suddenly sent you with him. This also had a reason. You see, you and I have a particular karmic connection. Namely, wherever I introduce the Dharma, you are the first to go, like a pioneer. That's why, at that time, I sent you with a Kempo. And, therefore, you definitely have to go to the West now. It is an important and auspicious sign, and you cannot object. You must go. <laughs> In Europe, you must give blessings, empowerments, and Dharma teachings. Just simply do what Kala Rinpoche does. You shouldn't present yourself as a small, unimportant Lama, as if you were a nobody. Between you and Kala Rinpoche, there is not the slightest difference. In order for you to be completely confident, I can tell you about your past karma that enables you now to do all this. I can tell you who you were in previous lives, or if you don't want to hear it now, I can also tell you this at another time. I replied that I certainly didn't have to know and that he shouldn't tell me anything. <laughs> The Karmapa continued to say, once you are in Europe, you should build a temple, a monastery, and a retreat center and teach the Dharma. You should not restrict your Dharma activity to one country or one small area. Rather, spread the Dharma everywhere. And in that way, many people will have contact with and develop confidence in Buddhism. You must go soon, because the time is ripe and one must act at the right time. People have very strong emotions, and the situation can very quickly change. Therefore, you must now go to the West. Times and people will change. If the Dharma is not established everywhere, enormous suffering will occur, similar to the suffering which beings experience in the Hell Realms. If we succeed in introducing the Dharma everywhere, this suffering will be minimized. We are providing people with a possibility to understand their emotions, distinguish between positive and negative, enabling them to act in a positive way. This would really benefit the world, and therefore I send you to the West. It is extremely important to do a lot to truly benefit beings. Thus, it is essential that the Dharma is introduced everywhere. <laughs> The Karmapa continued, It will be very difficult for Tibet to gain independence, and even if this would happen, we certainly cannot return. We will stay here in India. 
Furthermore, there will be a time when difficulties will arise for the Tulkus and where they won't have any place to live. If you go now, then you will be able to set up a place so that their activity for the welfare of beings can flourish. This is why you must build this monastery. In Tibet, the Dharma will be re-established and people will be able to practice again to a small degree. They will only be able to practice alongside their work. It will never be as it was in the past when people could fully concentrate on their Dharma practice. Therefore, more than likely, it will be very difficult to fully stabilize the Dharma in Tibet and thus it will not last there for a long time. In Bhutan, the situation is quite all right, though it is uncertain how stable it will be in the future. In Sikkim, it is very good at the moment, but Sikkim will lose its independence. Regarding Rumtek, it will not remain as it is now. It is possible that the relics will be in great danger in Rumtek. This is why I am now considering taking them to the West, where there is a more stable situation. There are many important relics here. It would be exaggerated to say that half the relics we had in Tibet are now in Rumtek. I have collected the most important relics from everywhere, and most certainly one-third are now here. I was able to save them, and not even one single precious relic was left in Surpu. However, in the future, there is a great danger that they will be lost in Rumtek. Therefore, I hope that I can preserve them in the West, and this is why you should definitely build a suitable monastery. Already now, I would like you to take to the West a number of those important relics that you saw yesterday. I replied, I wouldn't like to. Sooner or later, people would start to slander me, saying that Lama Gendin just took the relics. I said, for the time being, it is better to keep them at Rumtek. After this, he showed me many statues, also the very holy ones that radiate with blessings. He emphasized that, in the near future, I should definitely take these relics to the West to ensure that they will not be lost. One night, the Karmapa sent a monk called Chogyal to pick me up. I told the monk, not now, before dawn, one still sees the stars in the sky. It is still night. Chogyal explained that the Karmapa had requested him to immediately bring me to him, and for this reason I should come along. I refused once again, yet he insisted and said that he would wait for me until I came. So I went to the Karmapa. He was sitting on a large chair on the terrace in front of his house. At the other end of the terrace there was a similar chair, and the Karmapa told me that I should get it and sit next to him. The chair was too heavy for me to carry. So the Karmapa himself helped me to bring the chair over. The Karmapa invited me to sit down and then bless me. He put both hands on my head and recited a prayer to the lineage, Dorje Chang, Tilo, Naro, Marpa and Mila, and so on. 
The Karmapa recited this prayer three times and told me that now he had transferred the entire transmission and blessing of the lineage. Thereby I became a holder of his lineage. Then he prayed to the Dharma protectors, Dakinis and Viras, informing them that he had passed on the transmission to me and that they should provide their protection and support. He also recited this three times. I was so overwhelmed that I could only cry. I thought, what is this great master saying? And I looked around three times to be sure that no one saw me. I was truly embarrassed that the Karmapa had given me a simple lama, the transmission, and that he had paid so much attention to me. My eyes were full of tears, and I was trembling from excitement. It was a shock for me. Up to now, I have hardly spoken of this event where the Karmapa made me a holder of his lineage. At that time, the Karmapa told me so many things. Even until today, the memory of this brings tears to my eyes. Then the Karmapa showed me pictures of all kinds of temples and monasteries, and one after another, and told me I should build something similar in Europe. We sat like this until dawn. The Karmapa advised me on so many things. Then tea was served. <laughs> Later, when the Karmapa came to Europe, I still hadn't been able to build a temple. However, he said I shouldn't worry, nor be discouraged. I should first establish a retreat center, and thereafter, everything else would naturally manifest. The Karmapa literally told me, you should definitely build a retreat center and you will be able to do that. You should establish a temple and a Dharma center and you will also be able to do that. You should ordain many monks and establish a nunnery and you will manage this too. The Karmapa repeated this a few times. At that time, I thought to myself, I am an old man and the Karmapa gave me so many responsibilities. How could I ever possibly manage? I was speechless. I just couldn't imagine how this would be possible and therefore I didn't say anything regarding these plans. However, the Karmapa knew right away what I thought and said, You will live longer than I. Even though I am younger than you, I will die before you and then you must stay to fulfill these tasks. I have transmitted to you all the necessary blessings, powers and abilities. Therefore, you will be able to accomplish all of this. After my present incarnation and before you die, we will certainly meet again. I am sure you will only pass away after that. I now gave you some responsibilities. Please don't think you won't manage. If it wouldn't be your karma to do all that, it would be impossible anyway. Trust me, the time is right and you have the right karma. You won't have any difficulties. If you only have a little confidence that I am the karmapa, you will be able to accomplish everything. Trust me, I am the karmapa. Your abilities to accomplish all this are not from this life. It comes from your previous lives. The two of us have been working together for the Dharma during many lifetimes. This is where your present karma comes from. You are like a pioneer for my work. It is your karma to go to the West now. Even if you wanted to attain Buddhahood in this life, it wouldn't be possible. Also in the future, the two of us will go on working for the Dharma. For two more lifetimes, you will continue to work together with me. 
Thereafter, you don't need to take rebirth anymore, and you will be fully enlightened. I, myself, will definitely manifest in this world as a Karmapa for another three or four lifetimes. Thereafter, my activity will spread out through many manifestations, but without the name Karmapa. The tasks I entrusted you with will not cause you any problems. Trust me, I am the Karmapa, not just anybody. I know your activities will naturally manifest simply due to your karma. You don't need to worry at all. There won't be anybody to take care of the centers in the future. Shamar Rinpoche will then be there to look after them. So the Karmapa assured me that the Sharmapa will take over these responsibilities. At that time, the Karmapa gave me numerous instructions, a lot more than what I have said now. But these were the main points. Lama Jigmala is aware of all these instructions. He was always with the Karmapa, just like the other most important disciples of the Karmapa. Jigmala was always close to him. When the Karmapa told me to do all this, I did not feel I would be able to accomplish it. I am nothing. I am just an old man without any qualities. This is why I did not promise anything to the Karmapa. I just sat there and listened. Upon leaving Rumtek, I told him, You once said the West is like Dewa Chen. I simply think that I will fly to this pure land. But the Karmapa replied, Don't say this. The West is certainly not comparable to Dewa Chen. Even though life there is very comfortable, still, it is nothing but a human realm. <laughs> Finally, he told me, you should always decide on your own. You have my full personal support. You can always refer back to me and say that you are acting on my behalf. I will be there for you. See how you are doing and what you do. You can be certain of my total support. In addition, I will give you a letter of authority to take with you. I told the Karmapa that I didn't need this, but he answered, no, there will be a time when you need this personal written clarification, and it is better if you would take this now. But I said, I don't need it. If you, as the Karmapa, say that everything will work out, I don't need any written authorization. In fact, later there were difficulties regarding the temple project and the retreat center. At that time, Jigmala was together with a Karmapa in America and told him about these troubles in France. Consequently, the Karmapa sent a letter in which he said, Things should be arranged exactly as Lama Gendin decides. There should be no further discussions. He wrote that he had given me his full blessing and that people should not have any doubts regarding my decisions. So, that's how I ended up with this letter of authorization that the Karmapa wanted to give me already from the beginning. And everything developed very well. Whatever the Karmapa says will be fulfilled. <laughs> <laughs> it might be that I have forgotten a number of the Karmapa's instructions, but as I previously said, Lama Jigmala knows them all. You can ask him. He was always with the Karmapa. He lived in his rooms, ate with him. He was simply always with him, also when he traveled. Mm. So, uh, I have known Jigmila since he was a child, and, well, today he is a grown-up. He was present during all important events. Only on that occasion, when the Karmapa gave me the transmission and fully blessed me, was I alone with the Karmapa. All prophecies the Karmapa makes come true. A number of them have not yet been revealed, but also they will manifest.